Welcome to a narrative of love, a series of conversations with thinkers, leaders, and spiritual teachers about their understanding of love and how they see the significance of love in our personal and political lives. I'm Shito Gil, and I'm your host of this conversation series. Joining us today is Bob Boister, President and CEO of the Fetzer Institute a US-based philanthropic organization founded by John E. Fetzer. A warm welcome to you, Bob. Many thanks for joining me in this narrative of a love conversation. As you know, this is in preparation for the fifth Spirit of Humanity Forum, entitled Towards a Loving World, Leadership and the Governance for Wellbeing. You might have already guessed the first half of the theme is precisely inspired by Fesser Institute's work, which focuses on building a spiritual foundation for a loving world. And the second half of the theme recognizes the imperative of healing and well-being, including human well-being and the wellness of our ecosystem. So it would be great if we could explore the topics like love, spirituality, well-being, and how leadership and governance might play a part in nurturing all this. If I were a poet, I'd have a much more inspirational definition of love. But being trained as a lawyer, I have a very uh, operational definition of love and actually it serves me well. So uh, if I think about what the relationship is between the lover and the beloved, the first thing is the lover just wants to be in communion, wants to be in the deepest possible relationship with his or her beloved. Uh, and then the second element for me is the lover uh, has this wholehearted commitment to the flourishing of the beloved. So when we love another person or when we love the natural world, our deepest desire is to see our beloved flourish. And then recently I've added a third definite or third criteria, which for me is important, which is when we achieve that love uh, with another person, it leads us uh, not only to want each other's flourishing, but to want to join together and try to work for the flourishing of everyone else and everything else. So I, I really come back to that three-part operational definition uh, as a very practical guide, uh, and I think it is. Now, my life's journey and how I've gotten to this point, uh, it's been a long journey first off, but I'll say uh, I had the blessing of being born into a loving family. And I think we learn to love by being loved. And, uh, and, and I was blessed in that regard. Uh, I was also born into a family of faith. Uh, and what I was taught and what I was shown was that uh, the truest thing we can say about fundamental reality uh, is captured within the Christian tradition by the statement that God is love. Uh, that there is uh, a fundamental presence uh, in the universe that holds each of us in love. Uh, and reflecting back, I think uh, that uh, divine reality wants to be in communion with me, uh, wants my flourishing, uh, and wants to join with me in promoting the flourishing of all. Um, and I'd say I got to a very... Uh, uh, beginning understanding of that, probably by the time I was an adolescent. Uh, and so I had this sense that uh, the reason I'm here is to learn how to love and to love. Uh, and I've found that that's transformed both my personal life and my professional life. Uh, it's you know, brought to my marriage a, a sense of, of, of sacrament, that it's really a holy relationship. And it's brought to my work a sense of vocation, that uh, I'm, I'm here to use the gifts I've been given to develop those gifts uh, and put them in service of the good of all. Wow. Communing, desiring the flourishing of the beloved and caring for the co-flourishing of all. What a beautiful and inspirational threefold notion of love. Indeed, your life in living out this divine reality through love is simultaneously a gift you receive 
from the world and the gift you offer to the world. It's beautiful. So given your experience of love and your understanding of love, how might we be reassured by this possibility of the gift of love in this reciprocal way? I think love is the only thing that uh, can save us in this moment, uh, not just the COVID moment, but uh, in relation to the existential threats we face as humanity in the beginning of the 21st century, whether it's uh, climate change and environmental degradation or ethnic and religious conflict or the economic dislocations from globalization. I think you're exactly right. All of those forces are, uh, sending us to a place of fear and fracture. Uh, and I think love is the only human impulse that's possibly strong enough to, to, to overcome those things that are pulling us apart and pulling us down. So far from being a, a, a soft-headed uh, response, I think it's the only hard-headed response to this situation. Now, um, let's, let's um, put Fetter in the picture. For me, it is always refreshing to hear that an organization has decided to put love at the core of its mission. And um, to a certain extent, you have a huge part to play. And since you came to be the leader of FETSA, uh, and you have really encouraged the development of this vision of love at the foundation to FETSA's work, and hence, and, and, and building a spiritual foundation for a loving world. And so could you just say more about why Fetzer wants to connect these two things, spirituality and the loving world? Yes, uh, well, I, I just addressed love. I, uh, I, we, we believe, as I just said, that love is the only force powerful enough to give us a common place to stand. But why do we link it to a spiritual foundation. I guess I have to start by saying, what do we mean by spiritual? Uh, and very briefly, I would say that we think about the spiritual dimension of life as that part of our life where we grapple with the deepest questions of existence. Is there any meaning to this? Are there any objective values that are woven into fundamental reality that can guide us? Uh, and I think we face a fork in the road uh, a lot of people in our culture are saying it's fundamentally meaningless. We have to do our best to project some meaning and hope onto a reality that could care less about us. Uh, but then the other fork in the road says, no, no, it's very meaningful. It's sacred. Uh, and we go down that fork. Uh, and I think we go down that fork along with all of the great spiritual traditions uh, of humanity, of the human family. Uh, and so uh, we feel like linking spirituality and love uh, is tremendously important because we think the challenge of opening our hearts and love to each other is fundamentally a spiritual challenge. It's a challenge of going deep and finding uh, that love is at the heart of reality. Oh, thank you so much for making this important connection between spirituality and love and for highlighting the fact that the pursuit of meaning and the good life is effectively a spiritual quest. Now, could I just link this back to what you mentioned early about how love has led you to find your own true vocation? Once again, I want to bring the counter narrative. However, a lot of people, especially the youth today, would say that it is almost impossible for them to be on the same spiritual quest and to seek their vocation. Time's different, time had changed. So where might this starting point be to embark on this sacred pathway? I think in every human encounter, whether it's in our working world or in our personal life, we have this choice. 
uh, we can uh, engage the other person. We can engage the situation uh, from the perspective of a commitment to work for for their good, their good. Or we can engage it uh, from the perspective of what's in it for me. And I think uh, if we can just develop the habit of heart and mind to say that my default, wherever I am, is to engage for the greater good, not for my own good, that turns every moment into uh, an opportunity for love. Now, the personal response, uh, I mentioned that I'm, I'm a lawyer, uh, and uh, I went into law uh, with a general sense that uh, I could find a place to be in service, but it's also a profession that uh, has the potential to be very dehumanizing. Uh, you know, over the course of my career, uh, law really transformed from being a profession to being a job. Uh, you know, law firms got bigger. They developed the same kind of bottom line imperative that we think of uh, for any business corporation. So there was a lot in the culture of the law and the places I worked that, that pulled me away from this love ethic. But uh, nonetheless, I felt like I could always uh, engage from that perspective. And part of that was the choice I made about the type of law I wanted to do. Uh, I decided that I wanted to specialize in working with nonprofit organizations because I felt like those were the organizations where private individuals come together to work for the greater good. So I felt like, well, if I can just get close to those organizations and help them do what they're doing, I'll be making a contribution. Uh, but then also within uh, my law firm, uh, I tried to develop my own leadership gifts and ultimately found myself in a leadership position in the firm. Uh, and that was an opportunity to try to bring these values in. And I won't say I succeeded completely, uh, but at least I felt like what I was trying to do had a purpose of advancing the greater good. Uh, so I'd say if you can do it in law, you can do it anywhere. Um, so, yeah, on that, it is really interesting. Now you bring in law. Now, so what is, um, the, let's put these three things together. Spirituality, love, and justice. So all the kind of, uh, the counter narrative I, I presented to you early, the fact that human beings experience disorientation and perplexity. And today, young people don't only see a bleak, future for them. This counter narrative is to a certain extent owing to the fact that our global societies have been characterized by structural injustice in so many ways. So how do we actually take love as the real inspiration and the and in, 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 especially in the kind of a, the way that you define love, that is the habit of a heart. When we have everybody cultivate that habit of heart, then other people's well-being will become ours. Is that the beginning for building a just world? Well, I'm so glad you're bringing justice into the conversation. Uh, and inviting me to reflect on the connection between justice and love. Uh, uh, I love the, uh, uh, the observation, uh, and I'm not sure who to attribute to, that justice is love in action. Uh, I don't think that quite captures the fullness of love, but it certainly captures a baseline idea that if we engage the world from a place of love with a commitment to the flourishing of all. And we see institutions that are systematically uh, obstructing the flourishing of individuals and groups. We have a moral imperative to try to transform those institutions. Uh, and I think that uh, brings the concept of power into this conversation as well. Uh, we, we have to recognize that as Martin Luther King said, love without power is anemic. Uh, so I think 
those of us who share this love ethic uh, have a responsibility to develop our leadership gifts and try to get in places where we have influence and even power to transform uh, social institutions. Uh, I think when you look out at our social institutions through the lens of love, you have to conclude that pretty much every social system we have needs transformation. Uh, that's a long conversation, but it really does relate to this theme of leadership and governance in a powerful way. Okay, let's now focus on Fetzer. Fetzer has embarked on a journey of promulgating the seeds of love in the world. Would you just outline briefly how Fetzer is doing this and how does Fetzer instill love in action through its programs and activities? And let me take uh, the, the question of the racial reckoning that we're going through in the United States as a very concrete example to talk about that. The first thing I'll say is that we have this strong conviction that we Fetzer can't go out in the world and do anything constructive unless we're working the challenge ourselves individually and as a community. Uh, we're a community of about 60 uh, uh, people, uh, highly diverse on pretty much every dimension you take, uh, including race, uh, faith, ethnicity, uh, and- May I just interrupt there? Is that diversity intentional? Uh, good question. Uh, and the answer is that uh, historically, it was happenstance, but more recently, it is uh, highly uh, intentional. Uh, and so let me just give a sense of, of where we are on that. Uh, I, I think of uh, our program team. Uh, first off, we have uh, a lot of international diversity. So we have team members from China and Afghanistan and India and Ethiopia, uh, but also uh, uh, in terms of our just uh, U.S. Uh, community members, uh, we've become uh, much more intentional uh, in recent years about uh, trying not just to increase our diversity, uh, but to make sure that uh, we have diverse people in leadership positions. Uh, so uh, we have a wonderful uh, African-American woman, Shaquilla Smith, who uh, leads uh, our our culture development internally as an organization. So you could argue the most important job we have, uh, but uh, uh, we've just brought in uh, a new vice president of ally development, Rodney McKenzie, uh, uh, another African-American who brings a rich uh, history of community organizing, uh, faith-based community organizing. The other place we're trying to be very intentional is saying, who's in our network, our external network? Who do we reach out to for wisdom and who do we partner with? Uh, and there uh, we've realized uh, over the last couple of years, uh, we, if we, if we don't think about it, we tend to talk to people like ourselves. Uh, but uh, with just modest intentionality, you know, we've been able to really broaden that network uh, of uh, thought partners. Uh, and now we're working to broaden that network of action partners uh, in terms of very concretely of increasing uh, the number of partners we have that are led by uh, uh, persons of color. Uh, and, and so, uh, again, I'll go back to, uh, until we do our own work, uh, we, uh, we can't uh, make a constructive contribution in the outside world. Now, could you just say a bit more, I'm, I'm really sorry and interrupted you, you have the community of 60, just roughly 60 member of staff, and uh, what, what is your in internal process in terms of cultivating there's a sense of a community. Um, well, we have a really exciting process. We uh, committed, oh, I think going back uh, seven years now uh, to taking one morning a week, three hours a week and bringing that whole, our whole community of 60 together to uh, deepen into uh, our spiritual life together. Um, 
we have a wonderful guiding purpose statement of at Fetzer that starts off awakening into and serving spirit for the transformation of self and society. Uh, and when we began this, uh, this community building, community deepening effort, we said, let's just take that beautiful guiding purpose uh, and uh, ask ourselves, what would we be as a community if that really was the animating vision? Uh, and what we found is really focusing on the spiritual uh, dimension of that is that uh, we did have a spiritual common ground as a community. It took us a little while to figure out how to articulate that. Uh, but then the second thing was we realized that uh, we, we all got to that common ground uh, on very different spiritual paths, both within in a number of the great traditions and paths outside of the great traditions. So when we put those two ideas together, we realized that we had twin challenges. One was to find and deepen that common ground, and the other was to celebrate and support each other in going deeper on each of our individual paths. So that's been the big theme of this weekly commitment. Uh, and then I'll say one other thing. Uh, we, uh, we realized that it's one thing to come together for three hours a week uh, and, uh, and work on that. It's quite another and more difficult thing to then take that commitment back into the workaday uh, life of our organization and make it real. Uh, and so we've worked a lot on that too. I feel like uh, through that uh, long-term love-based commitment, we've been deepening our, uh, our, our life as a community and developing the muscles uh, or the habit of heart to bring love as our, our point of engagement. Uh, and now over the last year, we've been using those habits of heart to very explicitly uh, say, how does race uh, live within our organization for better and for worse? Uh, and uh, how do we become an organization in which everyone belongs in a full sense. Uh, and I use the word belong. Uh, a lot of this conversation is having happening in, in terms of inclusion. Uh, I have a strong preference for belonging and it comes uh, from my friend, John Powell, who leads the Othering and Belonging Inst Institute uh, at University of California, Berkeley. And John makes this powerful distinction between inclusion and belonging, where inclusion is inviting people who've been on the outside to come in uh, to the existing community. But there's this implicit notion, you're inviting them in to a set of norms that were really developed without them. Uh, and John's point is, what we really need to aspire to is belonging, that is to say, uh, inviting people who've been outside to join as equal partners in a process of co-creating something new, co-creating a community where everybody is, uh, is a co-creator on an equal basis. Such fascinating process Fesra has been going through. This almost remind me of Martin Luther King Jr.'s notion of beloved community. It is a proactive way of being together. It is proactive because beloved community, just like the Fessers community, does not allow us to accept any form of dehumanization, racism, and otherwise. So it is an enactment and emplacement of love where conflict, disputes, and differences I embraced through what you described, dialogue, listening, practice, spiritual practice, and so forth. So this takes us to Fess's work on healing the heart of a democracy. Clearly, there are many different conceptions of democracy and different principles underlying each type of a democracy. 
So the question is, what is Fesser's vision of democracy? And how does Fesser's work help heal those people who are traumatized by, say, bad politics? Great question. The uh, uh, question of what, how do we think about democracy? Uh, I'll just give a simple-minded uh, uh, concept of uh, a democracy is where a community of free people come together uh, in goodwill to try to build that beloved community, to build a society in which everyone flourishes. Uh, that's at least my democratic ideal. Uh, and it, it depends, uh, I think, most fundamentally on a spiritual and moral foundation of recognizing uh, both the sacred dignity of everyone else and our own uh, fragile and flawed humanity. Uh, and I think uh, the first brings us into our common life with this wholehearted commitment to the greater good. And the second brings us into our common life with a deep humility that uh, whatever we believe in terms of how society ought to be organized is a product of our own uh, life experience uh, our own very limited life experience. Uh, and we need to understand why our fellow citizens with whom we disagree have been led by their very different life experiences to whatever they believe about how society should be organized. Uh, and so uh, I think healing our democracy uh, depends on uh, recognizing how far we have to go to that deep spiritual foundation. Um, we could talk more about uh, the process that have, has pulled American democracy further away from that vision uh, and how uh, I think Fetzer's uh, uh, ethic of love uh, is the only thing strong enough to pull us back. Uh, so uh, where would you like to go? This is a rich conversation. Yes, please. I'd like to hear an example. Exa you already given some example. Just see and in, in this, under this heading of healing Americans, the heart of American democracy, could you give an example in terms of how Fesser's going about it? And more importantly, what difference has it made? Yeah. Uh, Yes, and I'll go back uh, to talk about my uh, work as a Washington lawyer. It was largely public policy work involving uh, mobilizing constituencies in support of you know, various uh, legislative initiatives. So I was right in the middle of uh, our national democratic process really for 35 years. Uh, and sadly, what I experienced was uh, a, a tendency on both sides uh, increasingly to mobilize uh, their constituency by demonizing, dehumanizing the people on the other side. Uh, and uh, so really uh, using a fear-based strategy that has led us now to the point where uh, a large majority of people on both sides see the other side not just as wrong, but as uh, an existential threat. Uh, and so how do we overcome that? Uh, that observation underscores the fact that how we work for positive social change is every bit as important as the change we're working toward. So concretely, where have we gone with that? Uh, we, as part of our overall democracy work, have focused on the role that civil society organizations play. Again, as I said earlier, as the place where private citizens come together to work for the greater good. Uh, we observe that polarizing leadership dynamic and ask, how can we change that? Uh, and that has led us to partnering with an organization called Independent Sector, which is, uh, as its name suggests, uh, an organization that has the mission of strengthening the voluntary sector, civil society. Uh, and because their leadership shares our 
vision for spiritually morally grounded renewal, uh, we have joined in an effort that we uh, describe as mainstreaming inner work within civil society. Uh, one way we talk about it is to say, uh, there are lots of leadership development programs for civil society leaders. They need to be incorporating a new dimension in that. And that is doing the inner work uh, of democracy, uh, uh, of recognizing uh, the sacred dignity of the other, recognizing our own limitations, and so bringing instead of that fear-based polarizing leadership, a love-based leadership of belonging. Uh, and uh, we've been at that for about five years. Uh, that spiritual work is now integrated in pretty much everything this partner organization does. When they have a convening, it always has this inner work dimension. And the truly encouraging thing is their constituency is responding and saying, we want more of this. And I think that reflects the fact that in this incredibly disorienting COVID situation, but it's bigger than COVID, people really need a place to stand that keeps them personally grounded, personally balanced. And people are realizing that this inner work has the potential to do that. So that's a good concrete example. Well, let's just follow up on this example. Elsewhere, Aristotle, by highlighting that human beings are social animals, he suggests that our natural tendency is to live together in political communities. Political or beloved community is therefore prior to the individual and is always organized in pursuit of the common good throughout our active life together. However, Aristotle never gave much clue in terms of what leaders of the political community should do and how they might govern and serve. But you did provide a clue. That clue is the importance for leaders to start with the inner work. The question is, how else may leadership and governance be transformed so that we can all live out this ethics of love? Great question. And I'm glad you brought Aristotle into this. Uh, the, uh, I'll say two things about Aristotle. Uh, the first goes back to your comment about social, we're social beings. Uh, uh, we are, we, tend, we always form groups. Uh, but we also form in-groups and out-groups. Uh, and I think one of Aristotle's blind spots was his concept of democracy uh, had a limited in-group and lots of out-groups. Uh, but I think one of his strengths was his focus on the critical role of virtue, uh, particularly for leaders, but for all of us. And his idea of virtue was uh, a, a uh, habitual developing a habitual or, orientation to certain positive values. So courage was big for him, wisdom, temperance, prudence. Uh, but the idea he was really talking about was spiritual and moral formation. Uh, and where we would add to his list of virtues is to put love at the top of that list because love is what really impels us to overcome the in-group, out-group and draw a circle that's big enough to include everyone. But the, the real point in answer to your question here is uh, I think we develop the capacity to be effective leaders by taking seriously uh, the challenge of moral and spiritual formation. That is to say, the challenge of uh, developing that habitual commitment in whatever situation to bring these highest values uh, uh, to the fore as the guides for our action. And I, I'd really like to take this a step further. Uh, we're talking about politics, but I would emphasize that I think 
culture is upstream of politics and that every one of us is a leader in the emergence of our cultural values because what is culture? It's just the sum total of all of the decisions we all make about what matters, what's important. Uh, and from that perspective, uh, every one of us is, is a co-creator of our culture. So this virtue development, this spiritual formation becomes critically important for all of us because we wake up every day and each of us goes out and has an impact on our little piece of the culture. If we get that right upstream of politics, I think the, those virtues will emerge uh, in us as citizens and in the leaders that we select. Uh, and so uh, for me, leadership development is all about virtue development, about spiritual and moral formation. It was throughout 2020, humanity has been experiencing a, a profound collective trauma on many levels. And the kinds of um, divisiveness, the kind of discrimination, the kind of um, dehumanization, systemic dehumanization had been so profound, but somehow COVID brought it to the fore. And not to look further, just look at Black Lives Matter as a movement. A, a return us to traumas that are historic that are historical, such as the, the, the transatlantic slave trade and slavery. And so all this invites us to reconsider the importance of collective healing. So without collective healing and healing historical wound, can politicians who embrace the love imperative take us towards a promising future? I don't think so. I, I think the work is bigger and deeper than that. Uh, I think uh, politicians are fundamentally constrained by the citizens that select them and, and whom they are trying to lead. Uh, and I think this lifts up the, the critical interplay between the citizen and the leader. And I'll, I'll address it specifically in this context that you're raising about uh, the Atlantic slave trade, uh, uh, the history of uh, just brutal racial oppression that is a, a central part of American history. Uh, and the challenge of finally coming to grips with that, uh, doing justice, and then moving forward together. Uh, I'll go back to the last big uh, surge of progress in the United States, which is the civil rights movement of the 50s and 60s, uh, that uh, was uh, foundationally grounded in uh, faith communities and particularly in the black church. You know, we think of leaders like Martin Luther King or Andrew Young uh, uh, as the spiritual leaders of that movement. We also have to recognize that they're the spiritual product of that uh, black church community. Uh, and it was that community uh, that nurtured the beloved community vision that then the leaders were able to articulate in such powerful ways. Uh, but uh, a crucial part of that, well, before I leave that historic period, uh, what we saw there was tremendous legal pro progress in terms of recognizing the legal rights, the full legal rights of all, but we also saw the vision ultimately frustrated in important ways because laws changed, but not enough hearts changed. Uh, so there wasn't the willingness on the part of the white community to go all the way and own, uh, I'll say our history of racial oppression, to lament that history, to commit to make amends for that history. Uh, and I think that's the critical work that again, we now have the opportunity to do. 
one of the core strengths of that beloved community was to realize that when you have a, a class of oppressors and a class of oppressed, their liberation is tied up together. Uh, and one of the things uh, Dr. King saw clearly was that uh, in, in profound ways, uh, that dynamic of impression does more damage to the soul of the oppressor than the soul of the oppressed. Because to dehumanize somebody else, you have to cut yourself off from your own deep humanity. Uh, and so that's the work we have to do together, whites and blacks in America today. And it is that work of, uh, of, of, of love in action, manifesting as justice, uh, but also manifesting as repentance, of lament, of a commitment to make amends. Uh, and we all have to figure out what that means in terms of concrete action. I don't know, but I know we can only figure it out walking together down that ultimate spiritual journey. Thank you so much. I'm very moved by your recognition that when humans are treated inhumanely and when humans treat other human beings inhumanely, we are equally traumatized and dehumanized. Therefore, it requires a collective spiritual journey to move forward as a part of our collective healing. Thank you very much. And as we know, throughout 2020, humanity has been experiencing a profound collective trauma on many levels, which equally requires collective healing. Most government and global institutions have already highlighted the importance of the three P bottom line, people, planet, and prosperity. In some ways, all point to the need of nurturing global well-being. And I would, as we said at the beginning, this is precisely what the Spirit of Humanity Forum would like to explore in our gathering 2021. So from your perspective, what kind of culture, what kind of action might philanthropic organizations such as the Pfizer Institute want to encourage in pursuing this co-flourishing agenda? thing I would focus on is language, uh, and particularly the third P of prosperity. Uh, when we think of prosperity, uh, we think first of economic prosperity. It's a word we use primarily related to economic well-being. Uh, and I think uh, what I would want to say there is that uh, if we're really serious about uh, human flourishing, we need to recognize that it's a much broader concept. Uh, there's a very interesting project at Harvard uh, at their Center on Human Flourishing that is uh, suggesting, uh, uh, I think, a five-dimensional understanding that includes economic prosperity, physical health, but it also goes on to say social connection, meaning and purpose, and character and virtue. Uh, think about how our public policy focuses so heavily on GDP, economic outcomes. As long as that's what we measure, I think we're going to continue to get uh, 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 societies and cultures that have this materialistic focus that fails to engage the real depth dimension of human flourishing. So whether we broaden the concept of prosperity to include this holistic notion of flourishing, or whether we find another P word that uh, fits better, I think the, the core message is let's, let's get clear on what uh, we really are trying to co-create here, a world uh, that promotes the holistic flourishing of people and the planet. That's a beautiful way to end um, this um, narrative love conversation. Bob, we will um, 
I look forward to you joining us in, in Reykjavik in June. And when we probably could explore new language, a new language that will allow us to, a language that is so compelling, that is so inviting, then we could all act towards that co-flourishing agenda. And for now, thank you so much for sharing with us your narrative of love. Thank you for the gift of this conversation, Sherto. I really appreciate it.